So good afternoon. <clears throat> so let us continue our discussion on uh, emotions, right? How does uh, brain handle? How does brain process emotions? So we began the discussion originally with uh, uh, how does uh, philosophical writings uh, discuss emotions? We looked at Indian and Western and all that. Then we discussed certain psychological theories of emotions. Uh, so then we went through a series of arguments and uh, towards the end of the last class, we just pointed out that emotions have uh, subconscious roots because we talked about this appraisal theory, right? Where you appraise a stimulus and uh, ask the question, is it good for me or bad for me, right? And then it is that, that appraisal is what creates emotion and that appraisal happens unconsciously. Because until then, uh, so there was, so the appraisal happens unconsciously. So because in the last century, like you know, uh, I explained in the last class, in the first half, there was a behaviorist evolution where people insisted that you have to talk only in terms of things that you can observe. And you can uh, easily relate to this to other, a similar kind of a revolution or insistence that came up in physics. Because in quantum mechanics, you know, people were making up all sorts of constructs uh, you know, which cannot be observed. So one school of thought in quantum mechanics you know, led by Heisenberg and others said that you need to constantly talk in terms of things that you can measure and observe and not in abstract uh, terms. So similar thing also also came up in neuroscience, right? So that uh, led to the so-called behaviorist evolution. In the second half, because of the development of the computing technology, people started comparing the brain with computer. So they wanted to explain everything that brain does, the way things happen in the computer. So even uh, emotions, the thought you know, happens by a series of steps, just like any algorithm. But that uh, very soon they got tired of that approach because people started realizing that emotions are basically unconscious, right? Without that unconscious element, that inexplicable, elusive element about uh, emotions. You really haven't understood emotions. That's what makes them very different compared to your cognitions or, or just what you call thoughts. So uh, the, the unconscious aspects of emotion, a lot of people have studied that. One of them is uh, Robert Jezong. I'm not very sure of the pronunciation. So uh, basically, he did a bunch of uh, studies, experiments to show that uh, you can have uh, unconscious factors in influencing your uh, your decision, right? And you can you know, systematically study them, con control them in experiment, and demonstrate that. For example, in one such study, the subjects were shown quickly, uh, in, uh, like you know, uh, what is called emoji, right? Like a smiling face or a frowning face. But only because it was only presented for about five milliseconds. And that's uh, too short for it to be consciously uh, registered in your mind. You won't even know what you have seen. You won't even probably know that you have even seen something. It is presented for such a long, short time. You need several tens of milliseconds to be able to become aware of a sensory stimulus, right? So, so they make use of this uh, property. Thing is, you can show that, you know, suppose you did this experiment with uh, animals, you present a stimulus so briefly, you can demonstrate that certain neurons in the brain of the animal are responding to the stimulus. Okay, so which means the information has gone to the brain, but whether it has gone to your conscious self or not, that's a different uh, problem altogether. So that kind of a study you can do in humans because you can't ask an animal, right, what are you feeling, what are you experiencing, and all that. So that's a, that's a big, <laughs> kind of a limitation when it comes to uh, performing consciousness studies with animals. So anyway, this kind of studies are done in brain, uh, sorry, done in humans. Right? And uh, so you present a stimulus like this for a very short time and then present a masking pattern like that, you know, the blue rectangle that is there in the middle of the slides. So you show the emoji briefly and then superimpose it with this blue rectangle so that uh, you, you cannot you know, think, you know, think of any, even if there's a working memory, it's very hard to maintain it because something else is distracting it now. Then after that, they are shown uh, some kind of a change, Chinese video, videogram. So I guess uh, the assumption is that the people who participated in the experiment are not Chinese or they don't know Chinese. So they don't understand this. This for them is a random diagram. So after presenting many such patterns uh, where pairs are presented, you know, uh, a smiley slash uh, frowny and a Chinese video gram. So, and so there is no 
uh, overlap. There is a unique mapping between the emoji and the ideogram. So after such presentation, after such exposure of the of the subjects for some time, they showed only the Chinese ideograms to subjects and asked them, "Do you like them or you don't like them?" So it turns out that uh, people preferred ideograms which are originally paired with uh, the positive emojis, the smileys, more than they preferred uh, the ideograms were paired, paired with frownies. So which means that although they don't remember what they have seen, or they don't, they're not even conscious of what they have seen in terms of the emoji, the effect of the, the, the fact that they were influenced by that pattern, that stimulus, can be seen right, indirectly by the choices of the ideogram and whether they like it or not. So therefore, your, their emotions are influenced by stimulus which you, you have consciously presented, although they are not aware of what you have presented. And uh, that controls your decisions, your likings, likes and dislikes. So here is a good example of how unconscious factors which are controlled by a third party, right, can influence your behavior. So several experiments of those kinds uh, have been done. Uh, there is a nice book by uh, Leonard Mlodino, M-L-O-D-I-N-O-W. It's there in our library, I think. Uh, so it's called Subliminal. Subliminal, it's also about the same problem. It, the whole book is about how unconscious uh, factors, unconscious processes in the brain or in your mind are studied systematically in science. It's a very interesting book. You should go ahead and get that book. So, um, so there are a lot of experiments like that. For example, people who are under anesthesia, right? Normally with anesthesia, you, you think they, they're completely knocked off, they're not processing any sensory information. But after anesthesia, after they have come out of the anesthesia, the subjects uh, kind of say that report back uh, things that they've heard while they're under anesthesia. So the thing is, the anesthesia seems to knock off their conscious self, but the unconscious or subconscious self is still awake, right? And that is what is, uh, Hearing, or you know, I guess the eyes are closed, so you cannot see, but right? the ears are open, so they can hear and they're able to recall that. There are even anecdotal information that the surgeons were making jokes about the, the patient, right, who was uh, on the surgical table. And uh, the patient, after the surgery, they recalled what these guys have said and uh, kind of objected to it, and things like that, and lots of kind of funny incidents like that. So the then another book called the Hidden Persuaders by Vance Packard. So this guy has reported uh, and basically described the experiments of James Vickery, right, about many such uh, studies. Uh, so one of the studies is, uh, says that they've presented brief flashes of messages. These are like three milliseconds, so it's too short to even notice, especially if you, if you flash it between two, two frames in a film. You won't even notice that something has been flashed, right? So uh, the messages could be saying like, you know, eat popcorn or drink Coca-Cola, things like that. And in the movies where such uh, subliminal messages have been flashed, uh, in the intermission, because I guess these messages were given before the intermission. In the intermission, the sales of popcorn and Coke rose by such those numbers, 27% and 18%, which is quite significant, right? Uh, so the thing is, which is uh, quite dangerous because, you know, it's like you can control people's minds, you know, people's decisions subconsciously. They won't even know that you're controlling. It's like this kind of a very serious society-wide uh, thought control can in principle be achieved through these mechanisms, which are, you know, quite, quite devious. And so there's a lot of public outrage against uh, these kinds of studies when these reports came out and became public. Another very interesting example of uh, such unconscious perception is what is called blind sight. Now, the blind and sight are obviously contradictory terms when put together in the same extent, same phrase. So what this means is some people who are supposed who have this you know this condition called blind sight, they are practically blind. They can't see anything. They can't see colors or you know, motion or anything. But they can very often and quite above the chance level perform visually dependent function. Like for example, if you say, hey, I'm throwing a ball at you, catch it. And you throw a ball and they can, they'll be able to catch it with reasonable probability. But there is no visual awareness. They can't see anything. The world is dark. Now, how is it possible? 
I mean, eyes are open, but there's somewhere damage, you know, up in the brain. Now, one way to <clears throat> account for it for this kind of phenomenon is information from the retina from the eyes goes into the brain. It goes to its first stopover, which is the thalamus. That we have seen that before. Now, uh, then from there it goes to the visual cortex, and from there to higher cortical areas and pre, you know, even prefrontal cortical areas where you make your decisions and so on and so forth. But generally, there is a lot of evidence that conscious perception or let's say conscious visual perception happens by the interaction between the visual cortical areas and the prefrontal uh, pre areas, the top down influence coming from prefrontal areas. So there's a huge cortical network. Uh, I'll discuss some of these ideas in the next two classes next week, where we discuss you know, the, the problems of consciousness, right? And so basically, there's a lot of evidence that uh, consciousness is basically a cortical phenomenon. So subconscious means uh, subcortex. I'm, I'm putting it very crudely, you know, it's a very gross uh, thumb rule. Now, so if the, suppose there's a damage at the cortical level, they may not have visual awareness, right? But information still comes to your comes to the thalamus of the person, and from thalamus you can project to thalamus has uh, nuclei or regions which project to motor cortex. The motor cortex can drive your hand, and not only that, even subcortically, uh, thalamus can control your midbrain centers, and midbrain centers uh, do have direct projections to your hands and legs, you know, through and because they project to the spinal cord. So there is a completely subcortical pathway. Which takes you from eyes to the hands. You don't even have to visit the cortex. You can bypass cortex. So, so now, if that pathway is active, in principle, you can perform visual motor function without having any awareness of what you're doing. Almost like a zombie, right? Uh, so this is sort of like this is probably what is happening in the blind side. Uh, this uh, phenomenon, but it's quite shocking because normally what we think is when we are Doing some performing some action which is based on vision, we think that you know okay the visual information comes to the brain and then we become aware and then we decide we means as the as in our conscious self decides uh, how to move the hands or whatever and then you you send a command you means your conscious self sends a command to the hands and hands move accordingly this is what we believe but it's not uh, exactly like that because it is as though the conscious self is kind of informed by the body. Right, that uh, brain is taking all these actions uh, based on all this sensory information, and then uh, in in the process, right? By the by, right now, Mr. Conscious Self here, I'm um, just informing you that is what I'm doing, uh, which is quite uh, deflating to our ego, but uh, a lot of evidence which points in this direction. So similarly, there is also something called numb sense that is there. Uh, the series that so they, they, if you ask them, uh, there is. They cannot feel anything in terms of touch sense, but uh, they can perform functions which uh, which make use of uh, the touch sense. So similarly, another thing is uh, deaf hearing. Okay, so all this seem quite contradictory, right? There seem to be an internal contradiction, but these are clinical facts. Okay, so like that, uh, I think we have covered a series of uh, ideas and arguments and theories uh, about emotions seen from purely psychology point of view. So let us, because this course is about neuroscience, uh, so ultimately you need to provide your explanations in terms of brain, in terms of neurophysiology, in terms of what's happening in the brain, brain structures and stuff like that. So therefore, we should also be able to answer uh, what brain circuits support emotional function, emotional activity. All right now, let us review some of that literature. So one of the first studies that showed uh, what kind of brain systems could be underlying emotional activity. Uh, it was based on this very crude experiment. Basically, these guys have taken cats and removed the entire cortex, this you know, surface and sheet of neuron. So this, this kind of preparation of animal is called a decorticated animal. So the animal in which the cortex is completely removed. This is just to study to what extent uh, in a brain which is in which the cortex is removed can function. What all can this brain do? How many things can it do? Because cortex is a more recent uh, addition in evolution, right? Before that, uh, brains didn't have cortex. So, so uh, no, how much functionality can the can the brain does the brain process if you remove the cortex? 
So in these decorticated animals, they notice that the animal showed some strange behaviors. Uh, when you provoke it, first of all, it's easily provoked. Okay, so kind of like, you know, it's like it has short temper, so to speak. So it can be easily provoked and when it is provoked, they and these cats uh, crouch down, arch their backs, retracted their ears, growled and hissed. I mean, you can easily imagine how when a, you know, a cat gets upset, uh, you try to pull its hair or something, pull its ears or pull its tail or something like that. This is the kind of thing you will, your reaction you will see. Only you don't overdo it, it might bite you and scratch you, which can be quite, you know, quite serious. So uh, it showed autonomic arousal, that is autonomic system is activated, especially a uh, sympathetic nervous system is activated. A pile like pile of erection, that is, uh, you know, hair raising, uh, raising of uh, hair on the skin and the pupil dilation higher uh, blood pressure, higher heart rate, and things like that. All these things can be seen. Then it can be easily provoked into, into an emotional reaction and uh, no regulation of rage. So what that uh, indicates is, cortex seems to put a lid on your emotional reaction, right? And if that lid is removed, you are more prone to angry outbursts and all that. There's no control over your, over your emotions. You know? So the cortex uh, keeps a tab on your emotions. We have seen one example of this kind earlier in the context of uh, prefrontal cortex, you know, in the case of Pineus Gage, because uh, the prefrontal cortex was damaged in this person. He was also very prone to angry outbursts and you know, using uh, use of you know, profanities and foul language and all. Normally we don't do because the prefrontal cortex act like a stopper on this kind of uh, behavior, extreme behaviors, uh, which can be thought of as emotional behavior. But uh, so therefore, removing cortex removed also the prefrontal cortex. So that you can see this kind of emotional outburst. In addition to cortex, there are also a whole bunch of subcortical structures which seem to influence your uh, emotional activity. One of them, a key structure like that, is hypothalamus. So when you remove the hypothalamus or damage the hypothalamus, it shows the animal shows highly attenuated emotional reaction. It becomes quite tame and placid. The hypothalamus is shown in this picture here. So the left picture shows uh, all this uh, you know, angry reaction, you know, the, the a provoked cat, you know, which is the kind of thing you will see in a decorticated animal. The hypothalamus lies ventral to thalamus, so kind of just below the thalamus. So the extensive connections to the thalamus and uh, midbrain. Uh, that's what I was saying. Midbrain has and brainstem, okay, so it has uh, connections to the spinal cord, so you can have this kind of a subcortical pathway that goes from sensory input to thalamus to brainstem to spinal cord. Okay, so a hypothalamus connects to midbrain and some other cortical areas that receive information from the autonomic nervous system. So, and it is like the highest center of autonomic of control of autonomic system, uh, autonomic nervous system, and it also controls uh, endocrine function uh, because. Hypothalamus controls the master gland of the endocrine system, which is a pituitary gland. Right? It controls hormonal secretions of the pituitary gland. And pituitary gland in turn controls the secretions of the lower glands, like thyroid and adrenal gland, all those things. Then in addition to that, hypothalamus also controls body temperatures and emotion, of course, it's a slightly vague term, but uh, controls what we have been discussing as emotions. Then uh, controls hunger, thirst, uh, circadian rhythms, but this is not the main structure which controls circadian, circadian rhythms. The the pacing of circadian, circadian rhythm is done by a structure called suprachiasmic nucleus, SCN. But uh, hypothalamus also has a key role uh, in controlling this rhythm. Now, if you stimulate hypothalamus, or certain, it's a small structure, but it has it's a very busy structure, right? There are lots of uh, tiny important areas in it. So if you stimulate some of these areas, stimulation of some areas causes pleasure. What does that mean? So if you put a tiny electrode in one of these centers and pass some current, the animal feels happy. Okay, so how do you know it's happy? So people have done these stimulation experiments where the, the, there's an electrode you know, planted in one of these tiny pleasure centers of hypothalamus. And uh, there's a switch, right? If you turn on, if you press the switch, uh, the, this electrode is stimulated and current is passed into that pleasure center. So the animal is given access to this switch. That means whenever it wants, it can go and press the switch and it will get its pleasure center activated. 
So it's like, you know, you can imagine that, you know, whenever it wants happy, it's getting bored or whatever, it will press the switch and it's happy. Now, the animal is so happy that pressing the switch and, you know, stimulating itself whenever it wants, that it would even forego food and literally starve itself to death, right? But it is happy just by with, you know, pressing those levers. I think in some people, even in the, the modern days, a mobile phone is playing the role of this kind of a switch, I think. Because people just are so obsessed with the mobile phone, they even forget you know, eating and drinking and all. But I'm just joking. So, uh, at, and whereas similarly, other centers in the same tiny structure of hippocampus, the hypothalamus, where if you stimulate, it will provoke the animal with rage, or it will produce, you know, elicit fear in the animal. So it's a very tiny structure, but it can produce a very strong emotional reaction. There are also other places uh, which shows inhibition of pain. Suppose, uh, so that can be a solution for, uh, you know, trauma. When a person is experiencing a lot of pain, if you can identify these regions, the hypothalamus and pass electricity, like, you know, stimulate them electrically. So that can be a kind of a therapy for uh, this kind of intractable pain. Uh, one more condition, again, a syndrome called Kluver-Bucci syndrome, uh, is, also, is also related to temporal lobe. So in rhesus monkeys, a kind of monkey in, in which the temporal lobe was damaged, uh, the lesion, bilateral lesion on both sides. The animals became tame. There's no fear, uh, also no aggression. So they don't attack anybody and they don't get scared if somebody makes some kind of attacking gestures at them. They displayed exaggerated oral behavior. That means they would put random things in their mouth, even though they, it's harmful, they don't get it, they don't realize it. I had a tendency to attend to and react to every visual stimulus. So, so even very small visual stimuli, they attend to it and react to it in, a, in an ab abnormal fashion. So this uh, set of behaviors, this complex of behaviors is called the clover butcher syndrome. And this happens because of bilateral lesion of temporal lobe, which means temporal lobe has a role in emotion process. But temporal lobe is a big structure. Which part of temporal lobe is uh, giving rise to all these behaviors? So here we need, we come to amygdala, which is a part of temporal lobe. And so it's located like this. So this is the temporal lobe. Hope you can see my mouse. Uh, within the temporal lobe, you see this long blue kind of you know, curvy structure, which is hippocampus. We discussed hippocampus in one of the previous classes where we discussed its role in uh, declarative memory. Right? We said there's a, there are two kinds of memories, procedural and de declarative memory, and hippocampus is involved in declarative memory. At the tip of this uh, kind of a tubular structure, a curved tubular structure, there's a very small structure called amygdala, which is shaped like an almond, apparently. And uh, apparently the word amygdala itself comes from uh, almond. So, uh, by the way, those of you who are Star Wars fans can relate the word amygdala to amygdala. Just a takeoff on this, on the same word. Okay. Uh, so amygdala is uh, also, sorry. Yeah. So amygdala is involved in something called fear conditioning. It's involved in processing of fear, which is one of the key emotions. So in these experiments, they, so they, the way to condition animal with fear is like this. <coughs> so as animal is inside a cage, the floor of the cage is uh, is rigged up so they can electrical, give electric current to it. It's a metal grid. So there's a brief sound which is first played in the cage. After a short delay, it is given a kind of a, the flooring is given this electric uh, current, which will shock the animal. So it's uh, quite painful to the animal. Now, if you do this kind of a pairing first a few times, sound followed by electric shock, sound followed by electric shock a few times. And after that, uh, and then in response to the shock, the animal shows a typical freezing behavior. It is, this is response to fear. So it kind of goes to a corner and freezes. It doesn't move any, any further. Uh, so after some time, the moment you, you just play the sound, immediately the animal starts freezing in anticipation of that electric shock. Even though there's no electric shock, it just habitually just goes and shows that feeling, that freezing behavior. Now this is called fear conditioning. So what happens is uh, when the amygdala is uh, deactivated or just lesion, uh, ablated, Right, uh, this fear condition didn't take place. 
that is if you actually shock the animal it shows uh, the freezing response but if you this connection between sound and shock right which is the, which is what is called fear conditioning that kind of a binding of the sound stimulus and the and the shock stimulus never took place when the amygdala was damaged so amygdala is necessary for fear condition now amygdala overactivity uh, also is uh, associated with uh, increased aggression right so there was this uh, case of this guy called charles whitman uh, who was uh, so who was at you know university you know who was in he climbed the university tower at the university of texas you know uh, at austin right and then randomly start shooting people this was 1966 i guess in us it is a fairly common phenomenon people randomly shooting students you know in in education institutions so this guy was later overpowered by the police and he was shot and all that so in a post mortem study when they studied his brain to see what is wrong with it they found that he has a tumor plus pressing his amygdala so that is making him excessively aggressive okay so so on the contrary right if you underactivate uh, you know uh, amygdala that reduces ex- aggression and shows placidity which is what is happening in glower busse syndrome glower busse syndrome they are lesioning temporal lobe in a big way in the process they are also damaging amygdala so that's why the, you see all these uh, symptoms exhibited by the animal okay so this is location of amygdala and the location of hippocampus the hippocampus we have seen is involved in both memory and spatial navigation right it's located in the temporal lobe and uh, uh, it has a very important contribution to fear conditioning just like amygdala So in fear conditioning, there are two things with which you condition the fear response of the animal. So conditioning means a kind of a pairing between a neutral stimulus and a response which is innate to the animal. So in this case, the the response of the animal to electric shock that is innate, right? You don't you don't have to teach the animal that response. It it always shows it. In conditioning, what you do is you you connect that response to some other stimulus which is neutral and originally that's uh, that response is not there so normally when you play a little sound to an animal it doesn't go in threes but because in these experiments you you bind the sound to the electric shock the animal was was connecting that sound to the electric shock and is freezing okay so that is conditioning in conditioning this kind of a binding occurs with two things there is this cue which is the, in this case the tone this little sound and the second kind of thing is the whole context that is the whole spatial context that is uh, the cage and the environment in which it is located the appearance of the cage and all that so in fear conditioning what happens is when you put the animal in a cage and play this sound and pass the current and it it then it freezes right now after that uh, <coughs> take the animal out of the cage for some time and bring it back to the same cage immediately it freezes or it's likely to freeze even though you haven't played the sound you haven't played the sound you haven't given the electric shock just by return back to the previous surroundings where it had experienced this kind of a trauma before right can trigger that kind of a fear uh, response in the animal so in this so in the previous experiments the pairing was between the tone and the fear response right or tone and the uh, response to the electric shock and this another aspect of fear conditioning is the pairing between the context the spatial context the environment right and the electric shock so the binding between the tone and the uh, electric shock for that you need amygdala the animal is requires an intact amygdala for that to happen whereas for the binding between the spatial context the environment and the electric shock the animal has to have an intact hippocampus so there are two aspects to the fear conditioning and uh, you need two structures to support these two aspects and these two structures are next to each other both of them are in the temporal lobe okay so when amygdala is removed fear conditioning to the both the cue and context was eliminated but when you the hippocampus is removed only the fear conditioning uh, of to only the context was eliminated so after seeing all these experiments and all these uh, brain structures which contribute in some fashion to our processing of emotions people have realized that uh, emotion is not uh, conducted or orchestrated by single you know isolated structures 
but a lot of these structures come together and form a system, an entire system for processing emotions. And uh, they call this the limbic system. Why this word limbic? Because limbic comes from the word limbo. Limbo is, you know, uh, is like a world between heaven and earth. So something like that is between neither here nor there kind of. Thing. So the this limbo is the, between this your lower parts of the brain which are involved in vegetative function, like you know very simple mechanical control of your body organs, like you know heart function, lung function, visceral organ function, things like that. And then there are the highest level you have just like you kind of think of it as the heaven of the brain, the cortical function, higher cortical areas, cognition, decision making, all those things. Between these two, you have this middle world, this middle earth kind of thing, uh, which processes your emotions. And this limbic system is thought to be that circuit, which is mostly in the middle, in the subcortical, so you know, it's a subcortical circuit, which is thought to control your emotions. So this is the limbic system. So other, so the hypothalamus, amygdala, hippocampus, we have seen all of them. And uh, other structures are mammillary bodies, okay, which is you know, shown here in this picture here. And uh, cingulate gyrus. Now, cingulate gyrus is very hard to show in this picture. Yeah, okay. So, so cingulate gyrus is very hard to show. You have to actually open some of the cortical folds and it's deep set, okay, inside uh, the. Just like I showed you in one of the earliest classes, cortex folds sometimes very deeply into the brain. And there is a lot of cortical, important cortical areas even inside those uh, kind of, it forms uh, sort of caverns, like caves. And even deep inside those caves, uh, we have very important cortical areas. And the single and insular, these are all some such areas. Okay, so you have this limbic uh, system or a limbic circuit, uh, which is like the, the neural substrate of emotion processing in the brain. Right now, let us you know, push on further and try to come up with an outline of our theory of emotions. Which is more grounded in your, uh, in your neurobiology. So, because the theory of emotion, which we have seen in the earlier, in the last class, in the earlier part of this talk, uh, is all psychological. There is no reference to anything happening in the brain. But just now we reviewed certain brain systems or brain structures which contribute to our emotion processing. So, slowly let us push on and try to review a little bit more of this kind of literature and try to come up with an outline of emotion, theory of emotions in the brain. So we have seen how amygdala and hippocampus process fears. The right is another brain structure which processes the opposite of fear, which is pleasure. And that structure is called basal ganglia. Basal ganglia is also a subcortical circuit. It's not a structure, it's not a single structure. It has many modules in it, what are called nuclei, right? And all these uh, nuclei form a network. And there are many regions in it. Uh, you can see in this picture, you have something called caudate and putamen. This is the largest structure in the basal ganglia, uh, which is uh, jointly called striatum. And then there is something called globus pallidus, uh, externa and interna, and then the subthalamic nucleus. Uh, they are in two parts to its subthalamic nucleus, pars compacta and subthalamic nucleus, pars reticulata. So, the, so sorry, sorry. Substance nigra pars compactor, substance nigra pars reticulata, the two structures here within substance nigra. And then there is another structure called subthalamic nucleus. Right? And uh, so the, all this form a very intricate circuit. Uh, so the this circuit receives input from the cortex and sends feedback back to the cortex. Now, damage to the circuit is a very important circuit. Damage to any part of the circuit can give rise to serious problems. And uh, so that's what happens in a lot of these brain disorders like Parkinson's disease and Huntington's chorea, athetosis, semibalismus, and dystonia. So depending upon where the damage is, you know, a person can experience any of these uh, conditions. Now within basal ganglia, you have, uh, so these all these structures, uh, stratum and globus pallidus and all that, they form, you can draw them, or draw their connectivity in a much simpler fashion like what you're seeing in this picture. So the Input from the cortex comes to basal ganglia, output goes back to the basal ganglia. And uh, that is shown in a simple picture like this. So this is the cortex. The motor cortex is shown here, sensory cortex is shown here. The input from the motor cortex, sensory cortex, or just cortex, is presented to the basal ganglia. Then uh, output of this special class of cells uh, called substantial nigra pars compacta, that is also 
that also is sent to uh, projected to basal ganglia. Yeah. So the output of basal ganglia is sent back to the cortex via thalamus because you know thalamus is a big uh, sensory motor hub. Most information, most sensory motor information goes through thalamus to the cortex. So it has to route its output through the cortex through the thalamus to the motor cortex because this is the basic organization of the basal ganglia, or, or it shows how it is connected to the cortex. So within the basal ganglia, you have two anatomical pathways. One goes from the striatum, which is this combination of caudate and putamen, which is called striatum. And, and uh, so there is one pathway which goes, uh, this, this is input from the cortex, goes striatum, and then onwards it goes to this place called GPI, gross pallidus interna, and there it goes to thalamus and back to the cortex, uh, back to motor cortex. Then there's a longer pathway, which goes from striatum to GPE, which is this one, gross pallidus, pallidus externa. From there, it goes to subthalamic nucleus, which is shown here. From there, it goes to GPI. So, so from subthalamic nucleus, goes to GPI. From there, it goes to thalamus and back to cortex. So here, you cannot really understand the connectivity because it looks pretty complicated. But if you expand it and kind of unpack it, uh, it looks like this. So there are two pathways, and uh, this this straight pathway from the input port, which is the striatum, to the output port GPI, is called the direct pathway for obvious reasons. And then there's the longer pathway from striatum to GPE to GCN to GPI, which is called the indirect pathway. Now, this structure SNC or substance nigra releases a chemical called dopamine to so striatum, and this. Uh, Release of dopamine to striatum has a very interesting effect. The, the dopamine release is high. The information going to striatum is sent straight on, straight on by the direct pathway to the GPA and to the output. If the dopamine release is low, it, it goes to the indirect pathway and goes like this. So you can think of dopamine as some kind of a, a routing system. At high dopamine, it selects the straight route, and a low dopamine it selects the longer route. Okay, why is it significant? So what happens is if for high, in the high dopamine condition, the straight output is selected, that stimulus will give rise to a motor response and movement is facilitated. Whereas in the low dopamine conditions, if the longer route is facilitated, is, is enabled, then that will inhibit the movement and uh, movement doesn't occur. Okay, so dopamine now seems to act like a gate onto your motor apparatus. With high dopamine, movement occurs, low dopamine, movement is inhibited or blocked. So therefore, since under high dopamine, the direct pathway is activated, it is also called the go pathway. And under low dopamine condition, the direct pathway is activated, which inhibits movement. Therefore, this is also called no-go pathway. But people have also discovered that there is a much greater significance of dopamine. Uh, in terms of its action on basal, on basal ganglia and the behavior, because uh, dopamine has a lot of connection with your experience of pleasure. So it's called brain's pleasure chemical. That is, uh, when you are you know stimulated by something which makes you happy, right? Uh, most likely that is causing release of dopamine by these dopamine, dopamine centers in the brain. So, for example, I said that you know in hypothalamus there are these centers which when you stimulate will make you happy, which you know, the animal was happy, right? And that kind of centers uh, do cause release of dopamine by SNC, and there's a couple of more clusters like that, which release dopamine. Similarly, if you take uh, stimulants like drugs, what are called, you know, addictive drugs, opiates, even food, right? Food makes you happy, that's why you like to eat food. It's, it's more, it's part of the purpose of food is subsistence, right, survival. Other part of purpose is entertainment. It makes you happy, it's fun to eat. Okay, so that fun part of the food is uh, is linked to dopamine release. Then, contrarily, if you apply dopamine antagonists, these are chemicals which counteract the effect of dopamine, the action of dopamine. Then they attenuate the pleasurable experience of the above. So if you take something that makes you happy, Right, and at the same time, you also take some medication, like which is a dopamine agonist, a chemical which is dopamine agonist. The pleasurable experience is not that much fun anymore. It is, it is attenuated. So similarly, not just food or you know these drugs and things like that. Even things like beautiful faces, images of lovers. So 
people have done the studies where uh, they have put couples in a scanner, right? And uh, they have shown the photograph of the partner you know, or the spouse, and that makes them, you know, that that presentation of the picture activates the reward centers in the brain. You know, all these uh, dopamine and other reward centers in the brain are activated uh, when the, the when the lover's picture is presented. Similarly, cash rewards. Why do you feel happy when somebody gives you cash? Because you know that that causes release of dopamine. So there is this set of cells in the brain whose release is related to pleasure, experience of pleasure. Now, moment to, so that can be interpreted as a reward, right? Something good that's happening to the animal or the subject. Now, so when, whenever, so moment you know that you know there is a signal in the brain which represents or encodes reward, you can do something very important with it. You can use it for a, for a very important kind of learning called reinforcement learning. Now, how does reinforcement learning work? So, so, so for a system, suppose you give a stimulus and system produces a response. If the response gives rise to a reward, right? Next time around, the system will try to produce the same response for the same stimulus. In, in other words, the stimulus response relationship is reinforced by the reward. On the other hand, if for a given stimulus, it produces a response, which actually, actually leads to punishment, then the next time around, the animal will try not to do that action or produce a response in response to the stimulus, right? Or this, because of the punishment, the stimulus response relationship is attenuated or weakened. Okay, so this is called reinforcement learning. It's a very important kind of learning. And if you see the way baseline is located in the brain, it is well poised to perform reinforcement learning. Why is that? Because see this, in this box, at the, at the box, three kinds of information are coming together. There is stimulus, there is response, and there is reward. Okay, uh, look at how baseline is located in the in the brain's anatomy. The stimulus information comes from the sensory cortex. Response information about what it has done before comes from the motor cortex, and the reward information about whether the action has given it a punishment or reward comes from substantial negative parts compactor. So all these three are coming together in baseline India. Based on this, it will be able to tell the motor cortex what to do next time. Because if it gets reward, it says, tells the motor cortex to do the same thing next time. If it gets punishment, it will the motor cortex not to do it next time. So similarly, there are reward sensing neurons in the prefrontal cortex also, not just in basal ganglia. <coughs> <coughs> So, uh, <clears throat> so <clears throat> in this case, the animal is given a stimulus like picture of a flower. It's asked to perform an action like you know, pull a lever or not pull a lever. Now just hold a lever. For the flower one, if it pulls a lever, it was given a juice, which is reward. For the flower two, which uh, if it just holds a lever, it's it's given and not a punishment, but a no reward. It's just a sound. It hears a sound. So animal is trained like this, and then they found that in its prefrontal cortex, there are neurons which respond to combinations of uh, action and reward. Right. So if if, a new, if animal performs certain action and if it gets reward, certain neurons were activated. Uh, so the activity of those neurons represents that combination. Okay. So so there are neurons which represent uh, reward even in the prefrontal cortex. Now, one more set of neurons are important for emotion processing. We will show why, we explain why. Here is the mirror neurons or mirror neuron system. So these are neurons that fire when the animal acts, right? And also when animal observes same action being performed by some other animal. What does it mean? <clears throat> so it's a mirror neuron which fires when the animal rips a piece of paper, but also fire when the animal, when the monkey sees a person rip a paper or hears paper ripping. So the neuron seems to <clears throat> mirror its own actions. So whether it performs action or some other person performs or animal performs action, the same neuron responds. So it is encoding that action. Uh, so these are called mirror neurons. Now mirror neurons are say, seem to be involved in imitation because look at this picture where, uh, right, imitation is a very innate skill. You know, the animals show it at a very young age. Imitation is very important because that's how one creature learns from another creature by simply imitation. And that's how the mother uh, 
uh, animal, right? It teaches the cub, right? A uh, lot of important life skills. So mirror neurons are also thought to be important for empathy because this is how you experience what another person is feeling by internalizing the actions of right, another, another person. Now, there is a dysfunction of mirror neuron system in autistic children. And uh, so that is uh, why currently we, people believe that uh, our autistic children are not able to understand other person's feelings. Now, for autistic children, they don't even have the concept that other person is also a person like them. Okay, uh, something uh, that is called the theory of mind. A theory of mind says that uh, I believe that the other person also has a mind like myself, has feelings like myself, and has can experience pain like myself. This is something that I quickly understand by when I see other people, right? And this is something that autistic children don't seem to have, and this is called theory of mind, because it is thought that uh, this kind of understanding requires an intact mirror neuron system, and in these children, this system is damaged. Then there are also neurons uh, which uh, respond to rewards that are obtained by oneself and by others. Because see, the idea of reward itself has no meaning unless you tell, you specify clearly who got the reward. Reward is for whom, right? Uh, so if you say reward is obtained, right? You know, somebody won, won a lottery, right? If it is you, you are very happy. If it is somebody else, why do you care, right? So, so reward, the concept of reward, unless you specify who got the reward, it's not that meaningful. So in the brain, uh, there are neurons which respond to rewards that uh, the that particular person got. Uh, as opposed to neurons, you know, as rewards that somebody else got. And uh, this kind of a distinction is very important, obviously, because uh, you want to win, right? And if other person is winning and you are in competition, then that's a problem for you. You are probably losing, right? And uh, so that kind of a distinction, distinction, there are brain areas which show that kind of distinction. For example, in social competition studies or games, uh, people found different brain areas are activated uh, because when you are winning, one area is activated. Somebody else is winning, other area is activated. Okay, and similarly, if you committed an error, there are areas which show that. And if somebody else makes an error, there are also areas which show that. So given all these ingredients, given that there are all these systems or structures in the brain with all these functions related to emotions, you can easily put together a theory of emotion, which is fairly you know, comprehensive uh, as follows. So we have seen that in a basal area encodes pleasure, I mean to the encodes pain. A mirror neuron system encodes me, the concept of me as opposed to concept of another. So with this, let us try to come up with a outline of emotion theory. So there's a very nice review paper by these guys, you know, Beeman et al, 1998, where they try to reduce uh, a wide variety of emotions to certain fixed number of variables. Right. And that is uh, any emotion that we know seems to be reducible to a handful of parameters, right? How is that? So happy, what is happy? To be pleased about a desirable event, right? Uh, unhappy means displeased about an undesirable event. Happy for means pleased about an event desirable for another. And I'm happy for somebody else. Resentment means is displeased about an event desirable for another. Gloating means pleased about an event undesirable for another, right? Or displeased, pity means displeased about an event undesirable for another. You feel sorry for somebody else. Hope means pleased about a prospective desirable event. That means something good is going to, going to happen, right? That's what the, the desirable event, but in future, right? And uh, fear means displeased about a prospective undesirable event. Satisfaction means Please about a confirmed desirable event. And surely it's going to happen, so you are satisfied. Hello. So like that, uh, this paper describes how you can explain uh, a lot of a wide range of emotions in terms of same dimensions. So, so you can see that in from the previous list, emotions can be expressed as response to something good or bad, and something that has happened or happening or going to happen to oneself or respond to something good or bad in terms of something that is happening, happened or happening or going to happen to another, that's all. All the emotions that we can think of seem to be reducible to these uh, few dimensions. Now, we have seen that uh, the brain systems of emotion that we have seen can make all these distinctions. 
where something has already happened or going to happen or is happening or is happening to yourself or um, somebody else, whether it's something good or bad, all, all these distinctions, uh, there are brain systems which can make all these distinctions, right? So in principle, you can conceive of a theory of emotion, but I haven't seen a kind of a comprehensive theory of emotion like that. There are bits and pieces of theory like that. You know, I'm just trying to make a patchwork of theory by pulling ideas from any sources, but I still haven't seen like a book or something written which will connect all these threads together and kind of present a kind of a comprehensive theory of emotions. Okay, to summarize, uh, we have seen, we've begun with the philosophical theories of emotion, right? And uh, then we looked at uh, how emotions can be classified based on facial expressions, and we presented a bunch of psychological theories of emotion. Then neurobiological substrates of emotion, that's what we have reviewed after that. And based on that, we have tried to present an outline of neurobiological theory of emotions. Okay, so with that, let us stop. And I think we have two more classes left. All right. And uh, so next class, uh, we will next class.